Um, so, so my name, and, and again, I know many of you, but is, is Lane Vermoss, and I taught uh, middle school and high school at Norris uh, for 26 years. And then as we were talking earlier, uh, I went and worked at ESU 6, which is Milford, for 16 years. Um, the last eight of those were kind of part time and I'm, I'm fully retired now and the years don't sound a whole lot, a whole long time until you add them together and I won't do that for you but uh, I've been around a long time but I, I do really enjoy what I'm doing. Um, and, and so this is on math routines. Um, and, and so I, I wanted to start with math routines and I, I actually just started my wife would say it's a disadvantage. I'd say it's an advantage of COVID and that is the number of um, online webinars and things that I've been able to do and I have time to do them. Um, so I have been going to a lot of uh, free webinars and things. And, and this is my book that I just got and I'm reading and it's called Thinking Classroom by Peter Lydiall. And, and I really like the things that he did in there. And this was in the first uh, probably about four or five pages of the book. And it's what math routines are not. Um, and, and I think that's important because it, it's almost made me change my the name of my presentation. It originally was Bell Ringers. Um, and I actually changed it to routines. Uh, but, but what it is not is routines are not. Uh, precise applications of known procedures. Uh, it's not implementation of taught algorithms. It's not a smooth ex execution of a formula. Uh, it's not mimicking rather than thinking. And it's not imitating rather than creating. Uh, and, and I think when you think about these routines, you'll see that they, that's not the case. Uh, what these routines really are, um, are something that you would do on a regular basis with your students. Uh, and they can be used at the beginning of class uh, as warm up activities, formative assessments, part of a learning center, uh, hallway bulletin boards, um, or as a class lesson. They're low floor, high ceiling activities, and they're designed to spark curiosity. And, um, I, I used to always share that my desire was to help kids enjoy learning math. I stole this uh, several years ago, but, but I've, I've kind of modified that. And, and I really want to be able to help students see the wonder, joy, and beauty of math. And so that's kind of what my goal is. Um, and I think I have a lot of people out there that I need, uh, that need to feel that way. Um, so I, I, I like to start with these two questions, and they're a big part of a lot of the routines, and that is, what do you notice and what do you wonder? So the majority of things I start with, I, I think it's worth taking time to ask the kids what they think you're going to be doing, what do you notice, and what do you wonder about it, um, to kind of get them interested. Um, here's a, another similar, and I'll give you the link to this PowerPoint when we get going. So if you wanted to use this slide as another one for notice and wonder. Um, here's just a couple. Uh, one of the things I think and what I hope to do uh, when I go back in the fall is be able to do some bulletin boards. I, I do some volunteering at Gretna Elementary and, and Middle School, and this is a which one doesn't belong, but it's a bulletin board idea of how you could post things on a, a bulletin board or something I'll call a sticky cloth later. Uh, I am a very big fan of open middle uh, and we'll talk more about that. Um, how many of you, I, I know open middle, um, how many of you know about open middle? Kind of, I, I see I, I don't have a lot of faces, but have you heard, a few of you have heard of open middle? Okay. Um, so, so that is something that I really like. Um, here's a, a way that you can do open middle problems. <clears throat> here's kind of a, a board. Uh, these are magnetic pieces on the left over here that you can put on uh, the bulletin board or a mark uh, whiteboard. Uh, you can use cards for it. Um, <clears throat> this is something we're gonna talk about, but this would be another way you could do it in a hallway. Uh, I, I just recently discovered this, and I'm going to start with it, but it's 
I think so appropriate now that we get students to look at data. And so this is uh, from, comes from New York Times. Um, and, and I really like the questions that go about it, but uh, it talks about what do you notice? What do you wonder? But uh, I like the last one. What, what's going on with this graph and what catch, catchy headline could you write? Um, this is sticky cloth. Uh, I've used this for probably about six, seven years. I'll talk a little bit more about it and show it. Uh, basically a sticky cloth. This is a um, tablecloth that I bought from Walmart uh, for I think $7. I cut it in half and so I had two. The nice thing about it is that <clears throat> this is just regular paper. Uh, you put a, a non-permanent adhesive and you spray it on and then paper sticks to it um, so that you can move these pieces around. So this one is you move them around to make equilateral triangles. Um, here's an open middle one. So you have these numbers here that you can move around to uh, make the equations work. And uh, I, I just am a big fan of that and as a center activity. Um, I, I'm gonna stop just a minute. Any questions or comments? Okay. He, hearing none, uh, I will go ahead. I think there was uh, a question in the chat. Okay, yeah. Um, so it's, I want to do a math walk along a walking trail in, I'm going to say this wrong, Hebron. I'm not okay. from Nebraska. Yes. Um, would some of these work for that? A teacher in Aurora did one and thought it seemed interesting. I don't really know what that is, but. I did that, Lenny. I put that in there. All right, Deb, yeah. Yeah, I just, we have a walking trail in town and I saw that a teacher in Aurora did one in a park in Aurora. And so I think some of these problems would be good to have, we have like signs on the walking trail, like whose trail it is. Oh, and, okay. Mm -hmm. You know, the elementary used to do elementary family nights and for different things, but I, yeah. we've, we haven't done a math one in a long time, but I thought, mm -hmm. you know, some of these might be good to have along the walking trail or have something like that to have a, you know, a math, mm -hmm. a math walk. I yeah. saw during COVID, some people wrote them on sidewalks with I, sidewalk chalk. I, I've seen stuff. a lot of the sidewalk chalk that where they did the puzzles, the open middle even on the on sidewalks. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I was just thinking some of these might work for that. Yeah. And and I do know you you follow that math equals love. And, I, and that's where I got a lot of the puzzle pieces from uh, as well. Okay. Others? Um, I, I like what's called low floor, high ceiling activities. And, and I'm going to give you kind of the two extremes. Um, th this is uh, picture equations. And, and so it's a way I, I, it, I've had done this with students as young as third, second, third grade. And it's amazing the algebra that's involved as they're doing these problems. They don't realize it's algebra, uh, but they're doing a lot of algebra. With this activity, though, the, the low floor, high ceiling is really dictated. You as a teacher need to decide what you're going to present to the student. And once you've done that, it, it's kind of set. Um, kin kins uh, are another of my favorites. And you're going to hear me say that a lot. I, I just have, I don't have anything I don't like. But uh, kin kins are math for uh, Sudoku. Uh, problems for math teachers. But again, the low floor, high ceiling, uh, they go down to a three by three. Basically, what you try to do with this is you, it's like a Sudoku, you put the numbers one through four in each row and column. Um, but these three numbers have to multiply together to give you 16. Um, so this is a medium one here, and they come in different levels, and there's lots of sources. Uh, this would be a high ceiling one. Uh, because it's what's called a no op. And so, you know, these three numbers have to do something to get to nine, but you don't know if it's plus minus times or divide. So, th so the high ceiling is dictated by the kind of one that you choose. Um, which one doesn't belong? I, I really like it really develops vocabulary. It's kind of a middle high floor uh, activity because as you do it, students uh, like this one, you might get a student will say, well, this one has a pointy side down 
and these are all flat on the bottoms. And when you do this with students, you start urging or you start telling them, well, the pointy side is called a vertex. Uh, the bottom side is called a base. Four-sided figures are called quadrilaterals, pentagons. And so you really develop vocabulary with it. Um, so, so you can see a little bit of the open-endedness of it. Uh, open middle, I, I really believe as a low floor, high ceiling activity. Some of it is by the problems that you pick, but it's also once you choose a problem, uh, there, there are just a lot of different things you can do with it. And, and we're gonna spend some time with that. But here's an example of a, a fairly easy one uh, where you have to put the numbers in this. And a lot of times there's more than one answer for it. A lot of ways you can solve it. Um, so here's another open middle one where you have to put the numbers, the numbers in the boxes, one through nine. Anybody can put numbers in the boxes, but then the high ceiling is to get as close to a thousand as possible. Um, and and th these problems go all the way from kindergarten up through calculus. And I'll show you that when we get there later. I'm, I'm also a big fan of three act tasks and three act tasks are definitely uh, low floor, high ceiling activities, uh, and, and there's lots of sources. I, I, I really hope maybe next year in, in the fall to maybe just do a session on open middle and maybe another one on three act task uh, to kind of show this because it, especially the open middle, it takes a while to kind of understand how they work. Um, this is my website. I, I'm going to skip my website for right now, but I am going to go to it if you haven't went already. Uh, if you want to type in your window this bit.ly Lenny V routines. All right. And um, I can put that link in the chat. OK, if you'd want to do that, that would be great. I'll wait just a minute. Actually, did did you get it in, Sawyer? Because I think I yeah. Could... Let me just make sure that I typed it right. Okay. Okay. It looks like I did, so I will okay. send that. All right. So I see uh, a couple of you are here. All right. Okay. So so this is the routines website. Um, and, and basically the, the PowerPoint that I just started is linked right here. So where it says PowerPoint, uh, that's the one that I was just sharing. So if you're interested in anything from that, you can go there. Um, I do have some other games and I'll talk about some of my other resources later, um, but uh, I do have some games and some apps as well as several other things. But I, I'm just going to give you an overview of this. There, there's way more than we're going to get here tonight. Um, but these are just some of the various routines um, that I have kind of done. It. And each box is similar. So I have usually have a picture. For example, here's a picture of a polar bear to get you interested. Um, and then I have a document with notes and resources. Um, that goes along with it. Um, and so here, each of these are then kind of the similar. So here is which one doesn't belong. This is a sticky cloth. Uh, so I, since I talked about this already, I'm just going to go to the sticky cloth details. So if you click here on sticky cloth details, it brings this up and it shows you uh, this is what you want to buy to spray the um, cloth with, it's a vinyl tablecloth. And then here's some of the resources and some things that I've done with that, All right? So, um, but that's, that's the resources that go with the sticky cloth and some other things. Here's three middle, here's uh, picture equations, kin kins. Um, Steve Wyborny has some things we're gonna get to, uh, cube conversations, estimation, um, clothesline math. Um, these are balancing equations. Uh, it, this is a kind of a new one. Um, 
it's a which one doesn't belong number line. So it has number lines, um, which number line. So you put the endpoints, uh, counting numbers, uh, number talk image. High school ones is graph stories, has some really nice uh, things from um, Dan Meyer. Same but different is another one. Two truths and a lie. Uh, all these would make good things that you could do with your kids at the beginning of class. Okay? Um, sometimes true, always true, never true. Uh, 101 questions, uh, just all the way down uh, are different routines. Okay? So once again, I'll pause any questions or comments. Okay, uh, I'm gonna jump in right here because I, I continually add what one of the, I'm a big Twitter person um, and I, I, it's just at Lenny Vermoss, but I, well, I'll get different ideas and I just put them into my resources right away. So this is one that I come up with uh, just probably about three weeks ago. And then the first one is Joe Bowler. Um, and, and hopefully you're familiar with Joe Bowler, but she has a website, Ucubed. Um, but she has documents with resources. And, and this is talking about data. And um, so she has a website and uh, all of her things are free. And so the resources, and she's a big proponent that we need to do more about data. And as I look at the vaccine rollout, the number of people that, uh, the things we have to take into consideration with getting the vaccine, there's a lot of things um, that, that we need to think about. And I think it's just important to do, to do data with kids. Um, and so she has several, uh, I'm just going to pick this one right here because it was one that was highlighted, so it's melting ice. Uh, the link is here, but all the links are up here. Uh, if you go to, this takes you to the Ucube site, and it has a graph, and it has a little information about the graph and some questions you can ask about the graph. Um, and, and just, a, um, a, I, I think, a great resource to use with students. Uh, the other one comes from New York Times, and it's called What's Going On in This Graph? And weekly, the New York Times has a graph. Uh, here's a couple of examples of some that I pulled out. So this is rising global temperatures. This one is a different components of songs that make it popular. Um, Here's the one that I did with the, the COVID, all right? Here's one, another one with COVID. Here's one with mental health of teenagers. Now, each week they do a live graph. They introduce a graph. They allow students to talk about the graph, submit things. And then uh, at the end, they talk about the source of the graph. But what's also nice is they archive all the graphs. So I'm just gonna go to this one, mental health of teenagers. Uh, this is a archived. So this was published in 2020. And so, so this is what the site looks like. Here's the graph. And then you can go back and see what other people have put in. All right. So, and then here's a reveal. It talks about the graph. It shares some, so you can go back and look at um, all of the other people that have done this graph uh, over time. Okay. So that is talking about data, okay? Right, okay. Um, the next one I'm going to go to is which one doesn't belong, okay? So on this one, I have, a, again, a couple pictures. Uh, I have a document, as in most of the boxes I do. So um, the, the document is just some links with resources about which one doesn't belong. 
All right, so here's some links that there's a PowerPoint here. Um, and then there's just some other resources you can use with it. So um, I, I'm going to go just very quickly to which one doesn't belong, um, the PowerPoint to show you what it looks like. But basically in a which one doesn't belong, um, what you do is you start and what do you notice about a shape? What do you see? What do you wonder? The two questions I talked about starting with. Um, and then you give some shapes and you ask, what do you notice? How they're alike, how they're different. This is an introduction the first time you do it. Uh, but then the goal is to find something that the property of the three shapes have, but the fourth one does not. And so it's kind of the odd shape out. And so here you see some of the different shapes that you have. Okay? Um, and there are all kinds of different um, resources here and which one doesn't belong types of things. There's a bulletin board. I talked about some different shapes. Okay. Um, if you go back to here, um, here's the which one doesn't belong website. And so on the website, um, all kinds of examples and all these have links to examples. So here are several shapes ones. Uh, here are several numbers ones. Here are several graph ones. All right, where you see which one doesn't belong. And then I, I kind of like this one because I like where you have students kind of develop problems. So this is incomplete sets. So these are incomplete sets where students would add the graphs themselves. Okay. Um, and, and so it, it, it's really, I, I found it really works well for developing students' vocabulary. And as you can see from the graphs, I mean, this is something you could do with high school students to notice a difference in graphs. And so it's, it's definitely not a, uh, can be a lower or middle school activity, but also a high school activity as well. Okay. Um, questions? Okay. Um, I'm, I'm gonna go next to my favorite. Uh, this is open middle. Um, and I, you know, I am going to unshare just so I can say, I'll give you a warning. I wanna know how many of you have, um, have heard about open middle before. So give me a thumbs up. Couple of you, couple of you have, okay, good. If you have, few haven't, okay? So that, that will help me a little bit, okay? So I'm gonna go back to sharing. Okay, so I'm going to go to my open middle sheet, which is here. And again, these are all resources for using open middle. So you can see this is one I think we'll be able to get started with it, but it's it's one I'd like to spend more time on. But I think I can get you started here. I'm going to start um, with a story. Uh, this comes from Robert Kaplinsky. Uh, um, and he's the one that kind of started it. Um, this is my grandson uh, last summer. Um, he is a ninth grader this year. He was an eighth grader last year. Um, and he mows my yard so that I can get him over so I can get him to do talk about math with me. Uh, <laughs> He does, he does very well in math um, and, and his biggest problem or his biggest, I guess, question about school is that, you know, he, he's not challenged enough. And so he likes to be challenged. And uh, so about a year ago, I had him come over on a Sunday afternoon and we started doing open middle problems. And this is really what convinced me that I think open middle problems is a good way for students to kind of get interested in math. And so we started and, and I said that we went an hour and a half. He said it was only an hour, um, but, but it, he really got interested in doing the problems and we'll do one where you can kind of see. But 
Um, at the end of the time, I said, oh, that was really exciting, wasn't it, coming over and doing those problems? And he says, yeah, it was okay. He said, it would have been a lot better if it wouldn't have been a Sunday afternoon. Uh, <laughs> um, so open middle problems, uh, we all have beginnings, problems all have beginnings and endings, but what, what doesn't, what is open is, is, is the middle of the problem. Um, so I'm actually going to do a little bit different example than the one here, but just to show you how easy it can be is you want to place the numbers one through nine uh, at most in the boxes to come up with a sum that's as large as possible. Okay. Um, so some numbers you might try is you might just put in one, two, three, four. All right. And, and any student can do that, you know, probably from third grade up, but um, you might say, well, I can do better than that. And students hopefully would say, so then you start trying numbers and you might think, well, you know, nine, eight, seven, six would be a good guess. Um, but then some students might say, well, I can do better than that. Um, and, and so then you just continue to uh, put the numbers in to see. And, and one of the things I like about open middle is that you can use it. This is an open middle question that you could give students that were working on two digit addition. It's one problem. It could be their whole homework assignment because they might work on it and do 15, 20 problems trying to come up with that solution. Um, here, here's another one. This is a kindergarten problem just to show you the range. Here's an algebra two problem where you put the numbers in. I'll show the resources where you can get this at. Um, I need to, oh, right here. Um, I just did, so, so let's say that this was my directions and this is, a, I can show you and we did a longer one. So basically I have a PowerPoint slide. And so um, I'm just gonna move the numbers in here. One, two, three. I'm just pulling them in like this. Okay, to try. And again, this is where students would probably first start is by putting numbers in like this, okay? And then you look at the sum, okay? And then from that position, you start to say, well, you know, can I do better than that? And I, I know by looking in the hundreds place that I've got 1200 already and I've got this number here. And so I'm gonna, regroup into this. So it's going to be at least 1300. So then I start saying, well, you know, I, I need to make this smaller. How could I make this smaller? So you might say, well, you know, I could put a five here and I could put my seven here. Okay. And then you go through to see if you can come up with a number that's closer to a thousand. Um, and then, you, you know, that there's some nice questions that you develop with this. Um, so did you just plug numbers in? What strategy did you use? Uh, what did you learn from each attempt? So, so there's lots of different ways that you can kind of get the, the students to do the questions. All right. So that's, a, that's open middle. Um, I'm going to go down. And there are lots of examples of open middle. I'll show you the website in just a little bit. Okay, so it, because we had mostly secondary, I'm gonna do the secondary example, all right? Um, so if, if you presented this problem to your ninth graders, how many of them do you think would get that problem correct? you know, a pretty, pretty high percentage, right? Um, and, and Robert Kaplinsky is, is good for this. And if you solved equations, and a lot of times they do this now in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. So it would be something students have done. Uh, Robert Kaplinsky uses, um, you know, Twitter a lot of times do this. So he polled uh, 1,100 sixth and seventh graders, 92% correctly answered that problem. And you think, well, they know how to solve one-step equations, all right? Uh, so what would the homework look like for those kids? Well, they're going to do more of those same kinds of questions, all right? 
Well, here's the next problem, and this is an open middle. So it's used the digits one through nine to place digits in each box to create two equations, one where X has a positive value and one where X has a negative value. So now you can see that students need to understand not how to solve the problem, but how can I come up with a negative solution and a positive solution, which I, I think you would agree is a better understanding of solving equations, all right? Um, when he asked this of sixth and seventh graders, 51% uh, got it right. So he calls this the, the, hidden under, the hidden misunderstanding. So we had 92 could solve an equation, only 51% could get this right. So there's roughly 40% of the students could solve, they could mimic what you're doing, but do they understand what they're doing? And, and that's really, I think, the whole point of routines, right? So then problem three looks like this. So use the digits one through nine to get the greatest possible value, right? So now we're looking at a, a completely different problem that you have, right? And so you do this. And what percent of sixth and seventh graders correctly answered this one? Well, it's even less, 37%. Um, and again, it just shows that students can solve equations, but they don't necessarily understand what they're doing. Um, and, and so I, I think it says a lot about the understanding that students, and, and I would say that a, an alternate problem for this one is to get the lowest value. So then the question comes up, well, what do you mean by lowest? Do you mean closest to zero? Do you mean most negative? Um, and, and so there's just all kinds of questions um, that come up with this. And so I'm a big fan of open middle. I, I, I can't go away. I'm going to go to the website. Um, and I need to see where the link is. Oh, it's right here, open middle. And so this is a website and you'll notice here at the top, there are problems from kindergarten through high school. So if I pick an eighth grade problem and let's go to equations, I guess I did numbers, but if you pick one, um, it gives you the problem. Um, and then it gives you a hint for the answer, and then it gives you possible answers. A lot of, more, a lot of these, there's more than one answer. Um, but th there is just a, a, a wealth of problems here. Um, th there's a lot more to this than what I'm showing you right now. Um, that, you know, he has lots of resources here for doing the problems. Um, and so, oh, as I said, at, at some point I, I would, like to you know try to do a little bit more with the open open middle. So um, I stopped sharing. So do, um, I'm going to pause and let you visit a little bit. Some of you said you've used open middle. How have you used them? Um, how do you like them? And uh, what have you done with them? This is called wait time. I'm gonna wait until somebody says something. So somebody go first. Okay. I think I've mainly just used them as like bonus questions. Okay. You know, like bonus questions. But I like the idea of, I have a big bulletin board out in the hallway. I kind of like that idea of having something different out there. And mm -hmm. and I'm still hooked on this math walk. So I think there's would be possibilities for that too. Yeah, good. I, I, I do know though, the one teacher that did it in her classroom, I did it, I think it was second or third grade students. She made a uh, little mag, you buy those, that magnet strip, and then she had numbers and she, so they just stick on the board and they could move them around. Um, okay. I think I can get one more. Trevor, you raised your hand. Have you used open middle? Um, I have. Uh, we went and saw Robert Kaplinsky at ESU3, me and a couple other math team okay, members. I was, I was there. I did not know you at that time, but uh, I was there that time. Um, and it was interesting um, kind of going through that and um, we tried integrating some of those into our test kind of uh, questions 
for those higher level students for them to to see what kind of concepts that they're understanding or not understanding um, mm -hmm. in our content. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good. I, I would share. Uh, this is a book that he wrote, um, and and I did uh, purchase a book, but but it really goes into great detail about. Uh, how you do the use this in your classroom. And, and I know one of the things I know, Trevor, you talked about maybe using it for assessment. He says, uh, you know, his first mistake was using it in assessment before the kids were familiar with the problems, how to do them. Uh, but he has used a little bit. But I, I like the idea of doing it as a, a practice for kids where you give them one problem and then let them do it. Or, you know, I think as you said, Deb, putting it up in the hallway and, and having them like that. Okay. All right. Okay. How many, while I'm here and can see you, how many of you have done <coughs> three act task? Okay. Couple. All right. Um, I, I would tell you, this will surprise you. My, that's three act task is a favorite of mine as well. <laughs> um, I can hear my wife laughing in the other room. So, uh, <laughs> um, so, so let me go to three act task. Um, once again, um, three act task is right here. Um, a three act task. Uh, it, it, once again, I, I would say, I don't want to say there's an unlimited number of three act tasks available, but there are lots of three act tasks. Um, that are at a wide variety of grade levels um, and things that you can do. Um, so I'm going to uh, go to my PowerPoint for this because I have a couple three act tasks or, or a couple that I show you kind of, I think I can give you an introduction to how it works. Okay. Um, so so you'll, you'll notice a couple of three act tasks usually starts with a picture this one here, the Tower of Pennies, uh, starts actually the three act task is with the Tower of Pennies. Uh, this one is uh, just a picture. This one is a video. So a lot of them start with videos and you watch the video and then the video sparks curiosity. And so you start with, and, and we won't look at the video, but uh, it's Girl Scout cookie time. So I, I would just ask you, um, well, I, again, I'm going to have you unmute. What would be, what's your question? What do you notice and wonder when you see this? So you're going to have to unmute and talk. How many cookies are in there? How many cookies are in there? Okay, someone else? How many are in the shade and how many are in the sun? Okay, how many are in the shade and how many are in the sun? Another one. Um, how about what kind of car it is? How big is the trunk? I was going to say, um, well, all you see is the end. How deep does that go? Yeah. How, how deep does that go? Yeah. So, so there's some things that you would like to know about it. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things they say when you do this is, is all, you want to honor all questions. So if a student says something, uh, you want to write it down. So, so I have a, a place here. Um, where you notice and wonder. So, so you, you write it all down. Whatever a student says, you write it down. Uh, Graham Fletcher is the one that does this. And he always says, well, some kids, uh, he did the one with a light bulb. And he says, well, that guy has hairy hands. And so he writes down, you wonder about the guy with hairy hands. Uh, but, but you honor all the questions that they ask. And so then you come up with a main question. And the main question, Deb, is, is similar. It's not actually, and you can modify this a little bit, but it's probably not how many cookies, but maybe how many boxes are in the, the thing. Um, and, and then you, the, your next thing is, um, so here's one for cookies um, and then doing the, the picture. So then uh, you develop a higher limit and a lower limit. And I like to put these on a number line and then you have the kids put their guesses, estimates on the number line. And then you say, 
Uh, is there any other information you want to know? Someone always at someone already asks, you know, how deep is the car? Um, you know, how big are the boxes? So then you guess, and then you give them some additional information. Another thing when I do this is um, I, I like to pull in the five practices book, which talks about as students are working with this, how do you bring the questions that the students ask forward? Um, and then you have them do this and then the information they'd like to know. So it shows a little bit, this picture shows a little bit more about the depth and you provide them a little more information. There's the box. Uh, you can even, um, provide the information. It, this would depend on how much information you want to give them. Um, you know, how big is the storage? How big is the uh, cookie box? Some things like that. And then the, the, the nice thing is that the video uh, actually comes up with the, at the end, it tells you the answer. And, and so there's, there's just all kinds of, the, it's called the reveal. Uh, but then you have all kinds of um, different ones. So, so here's some other ones. So this was, uh, this is a program, I pulled this out during COVID. So you, if you can't see, it's a truck that's filled with toilet paper or paper towels. Um, uh, so there you see, kind of looks like a paper. So all kinds of how many sheets in a roll or how long is a roll for this? Um, so, so you have all kinds of um, different three-act tasks. And if, if you go down on this one here, uh, I have some of my favorite three-act tasks, uh, but then you can even go a little bit further down and there's search engines for three-act tasks. So there's a search engine where you can go in and search for different uh, three-act tasks. Okay. Um, and those are all on that three act resources. Um, so, so going back again, each of these boxes are very similar. So there's a picture to kind of get you interested and then a link to the resources. Um, here's some picture equations. I have lots of picture equations, kin kins and resources for that. Um, I have about 10 minutes left. I'm gonna finish up uh, with Steve Wybornies. Um, math routines. Um, so just very quickly, this is estimation clipboard. Uh, and I'll show you where the link for this is. I'll show you this first one. This one has, I, I, one of the things I think is with students, we need to help them develop number sense. Um, so what I like about this is here's the directions about kind of how to do this with students. Um, and here's, and this has all grade levels, but it starts with this. And so the first one is how many objects are in the container, all right? And then the next one is, says there's 24 objects. And then you get this one, and then it says how many objects. So you'll notice it's less, so you can adjust your estimate. And then here there's more, and then you get the reveal. And then here's the one in between and you have the reveal. And then uh, for this one, again, for the next level, what it does is there's a length of string. And so you look at the length of string that's involved. So that's called estimation clipboard. Uh, splat, looks like this. So it starts again, it has the directions. Um, you count how many are there? How many shapes do you see? I, I like the, you know, and then you get a splat and then you have to see how many are under the splat. So in this case, then you'll see that there are two under the splat and then it gives you the thing. And I know that this is kindergarten, um, but I'll go up some levels of difficulty. Um, here, you can see is a splat. And 
there's 11 objects, but you have two splats. So now you're starting to get into solving equations because I have two splats and I have to kind of figure out how many are there. Um, then, I'm going to, oh, here we go. Okay, so just, just to show you the level of difficulty you can use. So here's a splat with fractions. So, so you have to count how many are there and there's seven and then you get a splat. And so then you have to figure out how many are underneath the one splat or the two splat. Okay, right. um, so that is called splat. The next one is called e-mysteries. E-mysteries looks like this. So similar to the other one, but the format's different. So in this case, you get the number of apples, but it gives you hints. Uh, as a clues appear, you need to figure out how many. So here's clue one. The answer is less than 30. Here's clue two. I have to count by twos. It's one of the numbers. And then you continue to get hints until uh, it never gets it down to one. So it's always going to be one of two numbers that you have to do. So e-mysteries is similar to the estimation clipboard, but a little bit different um, with the hints that are given. And again, the high level is, is actually more, um, oop. oh, okay, cube conversations. This one at the lowest level, this is K2. But again, what I like with this is that it says how many, but then it asks you to explain it in other ways. So how did you see it? So then it looks, well, did you see it as a group of four and four? Or did you see it as a group of six and two? Did you see it as a group of four and two groups of two? Uh, and then it gives you the reveal and then it gives you another one. Um, but to show you, I'm skipping way down to the bottom, all right? Um, to show you the level of difficulty, um, this is the one of the levels that you have here. So here you have one and then you have to try to determine how many are here and then um, so, so you use it. So, so I, I like the thinking that's involved with that. Okay. Um, I'm going to stop sharing again. All right. Okay. So Sandy, I think that's you, but it says Grant. <laughs> yeah, he used my computer for a derby consultation and I guess he changed my name. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, well, um, you know, I, it's, it has been about an hour. Um, yeah, the, the one thing that, yeah, for those, I, I do like the focus on non-routine problems and a variety of solutions and that the students are mim mimicking it. Um, another one that I really like in the top row there is got something called Math Strat Chat. Um, and it, it provides, uh, they have some archive problems, but each Wednesday night, uh, they present a problem and then you try to come up with different ways to solve the problem like uh, 18 times 25. And then you come up with people submit different ways that they can come up with that. And they have archive numbers as well. So I like that. But uh, I would, um, do you have any questions or things that uh, you think you might be able to use? Those uh, ESTA mysteries, those are great. Like if you have kids finish their assignment, you have just a few minutes left in class or they really mm -hmm. like them. I make them write it down. You know, yeah. I make them write down their, their estimates and 
you know, mm-hmm. sometimes depending, I might give a little sucker or some kind of candy if, if yeah. they get, you know, if they guess it right. But mm-hmm. it, it teaches a lot of vocabulary too for, yeah. you know, the, the upper level ones. Yeah. I also want to put a plug in. <laughs> I am the president <laughs> of NATM and uh, we are holding our fall conference right now. We are going in person October 1st in Kearney. So save the date for October 1st in Kearney and we may be looking for speakers. So if you feel so inclined, let me know. Trevor is also on the board. He is my second vice president. So he'll be coming up to yes. do this. And well, so just a little be, be plug there. Good to get back together. Yeah. <laughs> I, and then Zoom's, o- uh, Zoom's okay, but I like to be in person. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that will be very, very nice. And then uh, we will have another math teacher circle next month. I've, I've put a few feelers out and just haven't heard back yet, but um, but we are hoping to have another one. And so we'll just, we'll just, Put the word out again and okay. see if- All right, that's I, good. Yeah. Well, Michelle, if you come up empty, I would be uh, willing to do either <laughs> the open middle uh, or the three acts. That's one. good to know. That's but, good to know. Uh, you know, it, it's good to have other people do it as well, but- uh, <laughs> <laughs> But you definitely are a wealth of information, so. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Well, ho- hopefully you found some, some things there that you can use. Um, I, I do have several other things. I guess I didn't go back to my website, but if you go back to my main website, that bit.ly Lenny V, uh, I do have lots of other links there to um, games and puzzles, uh, algebra, geometry, some things like that, probability and stats as well. So. Uh, and, and the other thing I would say is that don't hesitate to email me um, if you have a question or something I can help with. Okay. All right. Well, I have nothing else, but thank you for, uh, I, I, I did forget, I, I wanted all of you, I think, are in the classroom. And uh, I just want to tell you, as somebody that's not in the classroom, how much I appreciate the, the time, work, effort. Uh, it, it's been a, a rough year, and uh, I, I know it's been, you've expended a lot of energy, but it's, it's really been worth it to keep kids in school and where they need to be. And, and that is not the case across the United States. And um, I, I just applaud all the work that you've done. And I completely understand um, you looking forward to whenever the year is over. So, uh, but, but thank you for all of your work and time that you've done.